Management. All right, this is an interview at the Westbury Public Library, Westbury, New York. It is the 9th of August, 2006, approximately 10.45 a.m. Interviewers are Mike Russert and Wayne Clark. Could you give me your full name, date of birth, and place of birth, please? Uh, my name is George Greenfield. Uh, I was born in Orange, New Jersey. Uh, uh, April 29th, 1924, and uh, what else? That was it. Okay. Okay, what was your educational background prior to entering service? Uh, I finished high school, and then I uh, was thinking about entering into one of the colleges, but I didn't. It was okay. so short a period of time. All right. Do you remember um, where you were when you heard about Pearl Harbor? Yes. Uh, when I heard about Pearl Harbor, I was uh, in working as a, uh, I guess you would refer to as a sort of jerk, as at one time in a drugstore. And it was about 2 o'clock in the afternoon. And I remember hearing the report come over the radio mm -hmm. at that time. What was your reaction to it? Trying to think back that time, just amazement that something like this could happen. Did you know where Pearl Harbor was? Yeah, I had a pretty good idea it was okay. in Hawaii. Yes. Yeah, some people didn't know it all. Yeah. Okay. Um, did you enlist or were you drafted? I enlisted. Okay. Um, why did you decide to enlist? Uh, that's really hard to say. I know I was in the draft. I knew I was going to go sometime. Mm -hmm. And I thought of the branch of service maybe in my mind at that time what I would like best and where I could be of most help. I mm -hmm. guess that's that's the only thing I can remember. And did you pick the Air Force, or the Air Corps at the time? Yes. Okay. Why did you make that decision? I just, as I say, oh, I think just it would the be the most, okay. most interesting where I could serve best. Had you ever flown before? Or Never. Um, all right. Um, where did you, uh, now you, you went into service in December of 42. Mm -hmm. Where did you uh, have your basic training? Uh, basic training was in St. Louis, Missouri, Jefferson Barracks. Uh, they called it Ammonia Gulch. Uh, that was it. It was so damp out there and that it would go right through you. Mm -hmm. Weather. Okay, um, how long were you there? I really don't remember that. Okay. Um, now, did, you, did they give you a lot of tests and so on while you were there? Not really, mm -hmm. not really. Uh, uh, if I remember the real basic training, I have to regress on this. I think the real basic training really took place in Georgia. I can't remember. In Macon, Georgia. Mm -hmm. Now, was this the first time that you had ever been away from home? Yes. How, how did you feel? Especially uh, being sent to the South. Scared. Mm -hmm. At 18, scared. Really, because I didn't know what I was getting myself into. It was a whole different environment that I had never been in before. Everything was close to home. Everything was family. Mm -hmm. uh, that's the first time I had ever been divorced into a different type of society. So, uh, uh, you know, it was just a question of adapting, I guess, as mm -hmm. everyone else did. No one mm -hmm. else was different. I think everybody felt about the same way. Mm -hmm. Did you keep in contact with your family? Oh, yes. How often? Do you I wrote them letters. Mm -hmm. You know, quite often. Mm -hmm. I think there were some of those back home that I, that I had written to uh, my family. I didn't bring those. I don't know mm -hmm. where those No, were. okay. Um, <clears throat> what do you recall of your time in basic training? Anything that you want to mention? Uh, Nothing really, except that, you know, I, I did everything else everybody else did. I guess the, going left and right was pretty hard, uh, as it was for many people. Uh, and uh, But eventually, you know, either you got it or you were screamed at one way or another mm -hmm. until you got it right. Mm -hmm. But I don't remember much of that, except it was very fast. Everything was done. This is what we're doing today, and this is what we're doing tomorrow, and you better know it today because we're moving on. Mm -hmm. Okay, after you were uh, in Georgia and uh, Jefferson Barracks, where did you go from there? Oh, after I went to Jefferson Barracks and then I went to Georgia, 
And then uh, there was, I, uh, uh, I went, I was transferred uh, up to uh, Michigan. And that was, I was transferred to uh, AACS at that time. AACS is Army Airways Communication System. Uh, so that was your assignment then? That was the organization that I was going to be in. I guess they were setting, getting us ready to go overseas at that particular mm -hmm. time. Now, what were your duties in the uh, Army communication system? Actually, it was administrative. Okay. It was administrative. Uh, one thing, I don't know whether this is of interest or not, and this is not to you know, point out my intellect in any way, but it's a strange thing. Uh, in order to get to officer's candidate school, required an IQ of uh, 110. I don't know if you remember that. But uh, in order to get into AACS, you had to have an IQ of 115 or more. And see where I was a young, raw kid, and somehow I was being thrown in with a lot of school teachers and a lot of professional people, and I felt like, you know, the lost kid on the block with, mm -hmm. with all of them. And, uh, and a lot of them had the skills, but AACS consisted of uh, radio operators, control tower operators, uh, code, uh, uh, working on code and whatnot like that. Mm -hmm. None of that communications involved. Mm -hmm. Now, what kind of specialized training did you receive there? None at all. None at all. Uh, they, they didn't uh, categorize me to go into any of those fields. Mm -hmm. I think, I think when I finally got, I think it was Selfridge Field up in Michigan. And at that time, it was, it was like, uh, it, it seems as though my whole time in the military was bang, 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 move, move, move. I was going from one place to another very, very quickly with no time to really get to know anybody or learn anything. Mm -hmm. they, they didn't do that. At the time I was ready to go overseas, even up in Michigan, it was a question of just getting us ready uh, whether it was uh, examinations, medical examinations, checking papers, just to get ready to go. Mm -hmm. And then before I know it, out of Michigan I went and I was on my way. Okay, um, where did you go from there then? From there. Uh, we boarded a, the boat uh, which was the USS Lurling, which was part of the Matson line. It was a luxury cruise. And our quarters there were where you had a cabin that would ordinarily hold four people at the time. I mentioned today that we're running anywhere from 48 to 50 bunks within that room. So we were all tiered in at that time and, uh, with, with, on that ship as mm -hmm. it went over to the South Pacific. Now, did you go in a convoy or a single ship? No, I think we went on a single ship. Yeah, I usually the cruise ships did. Yeah. No, we never, there was no convoy at all. It was just that cruise ship. I have an interesting story to tell with regard to that, which I think you might find amusing. Uh, naturally, you wore a lot of clothes, so uh, what you would do, you had to find a way to clean them. And what we would do is you go to the aft of the, of the ship, and there was a, a rope that, back there, and you put the rope through the sleeves and the trousers or any underwear you had, you make sure it was good and tight. You know, tight, mm -hmm. tight. And you make sure that the end of the rope was built tied to the ship, because if not, you know, and then you throw that over. And the bouncing of the, the aft on the waves would clean those clothes. It's like taking and slapping them in the water, you know, and you really come, they really come out clean. And I was up there one day aft, and I had just done my clothes, and another fellow comes in, he ties it, and he throws his clothes overboard, and they never tied the other end. <laughs> and all of his clothes went into the Coral Sea. He didn't have a stitch of clothing left. The rope and everything else went overboard into the sea, and they were gone. And that's one of the stories that I thought was interesting <laughs> in the music. So, uh, and then, uh, how long were you on the ship? <coughs> Maybe it was about three weeks, I guess. Mm -hmm. At least three weeks. And it made good time. And considering everything, I mean, uh, 
There was really no complaint on the ship itself, I mean, for going over, you know, mm -hmm. except the crowded quarters, but that was to be expected. And you amused yourself however you could. You could at that particular time. What were the meals like on the ship? They were, as I remember them, and I, it's very, very hard, it wasn't bad, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, it was certainly better than when I got overseas, you know. Uh, for example, one thing I remember, uh, I can never eat uh, peaches out of cans anymore. Couldn't. Have. One day I had my mess kit and I put spaghetti and meatballs in the, you know, the round end of it and suddenly I go along and suddenly this girl takes peaches and peach juice and throws them in the other end and it all spilled down into the spaghetti. I said, never want to see peach or peach juice again. Uh, but we got to, uh, we got to, uh, we landed in Hollandia and uh, when we got there, uh, you know, we were raw coming in and uh, they set us up, you know, with pup tents and everything mm -hmm. else. And then there's another a thought, a story that always has lived with me. Uh, they were still, Japanese were filtered down uh, from the hills in, 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 in Hollandia, New Guinea that is. Mm -hmm. And you never, you never knew what was coming in because I think they were looking for food, although there was no force there. Uh, but I remember waking up the first morning and uh, I don't know, they had a reveille, it wasn't but about five o'clock or something like that. I see all these, the gee guys, they're taking, they're taking their mess kits and they're running like crazy. I said, are, are they out of their mind? I mean, is food that important that they got to get there? So I took my time, went down, I dressed, went to the bathroom and everything else. And then I saw a line. And I don't know how you can visual line, but if you can visual line waiting for breakfast of about four blocks long, that's how long the line was, all right? So I stood there with my mess kit in that line, and when I got to the end, all I was getting was the coffee grinds and what was ever left in this tin barrel or tin can that they were drinking out to put in my cup. Mm -hmm. The next morning, sure enough, I was joining the mess <laughs> run in order to get in line. That's, you know, that's one of the things of music right, that I right. remember. So, uh, but while we were there, you know, and I spoke to you about, for example, the IQ that mm -hmm. involved in AACS, but, you know, when you need manpower and you need to get something done, when you have to get that, they don't care who you are or what you are or what you think or what your job was, and they had, I would say, millions of dollars of radio equipment on the beach, on the, just lying on the beach there. And uh, they had to build a warehouse. So we came, uh, they just, as I say, once again, it's like sticking a, a file through the cards and lifting them up. And you know, these are the guys we want, they're available. So we went out to this place and uh, I had little and white hands like they are right now, and they had no digging equipment like that. And the first thing we had to do was dig a line for a generator. And it was one foot wide and one foot deep. And at the end of the day, I had blisters on all these hands coming down. But you know, that goes away too. You got out there, you work, you, you know, you didn't say, oh, I got this, I got to take three days off in order to cure. <laughs> that didn't work. That was none of that. So eventually we got that, and then uh, we started to build the, the uh, warehouse itself, and they set me up on the roof, and I had never been up that high, never been up. And they had this corrugated tin, I don't know if you remember, it's lapped like this, mm -hmm. and that's what they put on the roofs. So what you would do is get the corrugated tin, and one would lap over the other, then you put a nail in where you found the beam and bang it in. Now I get up on the roof, and I didn't have any gloves, and uh, suddenly I go in to get a piece of tin to lay it. I hear this fellow down there screaming at me like crazy. Don't do it, don't do it. It was too late. What he wanted to tell me was never pick up that corrugated tin unless you have a pair of gloves. And I got cut across the hands like that. So, you know, and this fellow was from Wisconsin, as I remember, and he was in somewhere in the building trade or something like that. And, uh, so you learned your lesson. You learned your lesson. And to do that work, we didn't, uh, 
you'll have uniforms already. You had GI boots and you had socks and whatnot. And uh, I remember at the end of the day, one time there was one thing I would had a, uh, a wheelbarrow full of cement, and it would get muddy over there, and so they put down these long planks to wheel the cement on. And I slipped off one day, and I went right into the cement. So I got this whole body in front of my body, and I went up to the medic to have it taken care of. He cleans me off with alcohol after putting a cigarette in my mouth. He says, okay, just lie still, take a, take a deep uh, smoke. He says, it just relax. And then he took iodine and methylate and just rubbed it right across all of that part of my body. I almost went through the war. He says, okay, you can go back to work now. So, you know, and that's, that's the type of words. You just went back, you did, you told, you told to go back to work, you went back to work. And uh, so uh, we did that. And uh, uh, we take, uh, 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 am I talking to? No, no, no. no. And we were, at night, you know, you were d dirty and sweaty. Now, the only way you could get a shower is there was a place they had showers set up five miles away. So either you kept clean, or you didn't keep clean, and you did the best you can. So one way you got a truck to go out that way, because trucks were rolling back and forth, you got a ride out there. And if you couldn't get a ride back, you'd walk, and all that dust after your shower would come up and get you. So uh, I remember that. But I also remember one other thing quite vividly. Uh, for those that did not shower, for those that did not they keep clean, I passed by the hospital where they had it and everything was out in the open. And I don't know if you ever remember it, but if you got a fungus of any kind, and you had more of that over in the South Pacific, they used that purple type of, 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 of medication. These men were lying in rows, rows with this purple, all the purple feet were purple. That's because they didn't keep clean. They keep clean. And the only way we would clean uh, our clothes, I remember, we took uh, tomatoes came in cans, we'd get those cans, they had dehydrated uh, potatoes. And what we do is we put gasoline in these cans, and we take the dehydrated potatoes, which came in five gallons, and then we cut the GI soap in there, and then we get water from down at the shore, and we just boil our clothes in there. And uh, Oh, you set them out to dry in any way you could, and that's the way we cleaned our clothes. So, uh, and then uh, after, uh, that's about all for there, and then once again, the file was lifted, and I was sent down to uh, Australia. Mm -hmm. How long were you in Hawaii? In I really, I, that, I can't even visualize that time. Every, as I say, everything was so short. It was like a cat read. You know, they were pulling my file mm -hmm. and sending me out. I couldn't get attached to know anybody at all. Pull my file. The first day I go down to Brisbane. And they flew me down there. And that's the first time I had fresh milk, it seems, and uh, vegetables in a long, long time. Well, that was short lived a few days. And then they flew me from there up to Darwin, Australia which was completely uh, bombed out. <clears throat> it was completely, every single building was bombed out. And there they opened up, a, uh, uh, they opened the headquarters in uh, Darwin because when MacArthur went toward Japan, there were islands that he bypassed that mm -hmm. the Jap Japanese had still occupied. Mm -hmm. And uh, they would send men out were part of AACS to Champagne Island. And what those men did was they were on scopes, four on and four off. And you can imagine if you have that type of existence, you're living, how it could mentally affect you. And uh, what and it, and it did. And these men only got mail once a month, they only got fresh food once a month. It all came in and that just one time. And I saw these men come back, and I saw them uh, psychologically impaired as a result of that tour of duty. So you say, you know, you get wounded and, uh, in some ways, but there are other ways that you could be mentally uh, 
impaired as a result of service. Mm -hmm. And certainly these men were impaired. They came back. I'll tell you, it was a pity to talk to some of them. It really was because the, their minds had gone completely. So they took them back. They stayed in Darwin and they flew them out. What hospital they went to, I'll never know. Now, what were their duties there? Just to look at these scopes. They were keeping scopes on these islands to see if there was any activity. That's all they did, all day. They looked at these scopes for four hours. Then a new shift came on and they went back to wherever they, they slept or anything. Four hours and then they'd come back for another four hours. And that was their existence all day long and all night. Hmm. Okay. So you could see how that could really affect someone if, if they're doing that type of work. Mm -hmm. uh, and as I say, it was a pity. It was a pity to see them. It was a pity to see them. But, uh, now, what were your duties while you were in Darwin? Same thing. Administrative. Mm -hmm. it was administrative once again. And that's mm -hmm. where I wrote these historical reports that I spoke okay. to you about that they asked to write. And they had, uh, they played music and they played the same song and I don't remember what it was. All I know is they played, they, they didn't have another tape or another record of any kind. They played the same song in the morning, in the afternoon, and at night. It just went on all the time. And it's very difficult for me to explain time because I don't, I, I can't say how many months or how many weeks I was there. All I know is these various incidents happened because it's over now, over, mm -hmm. over 60 years. Mm -hmm. So uh, after that, uh, once again, came the call to leave. And that's when I was sent up to Lady Island. Mm -hmm. Now, these reports you did, they were just, um, like historical accounts of, of a, an air unit and what they did That's in a certain right. period of time. That's right, and all that. For okay. example, the fact that these men were going out there mm -hmm. and so on. Mm -hmm. And I included all those things in those reports. And as I say, I don't ever know what happened to those historical reports that I wrote. Mm -hmm. When I was a young kid, I had not had any other high school. I had no formal training or writing of any kind. Mm -hmm. I just did it at that time. Okay, what was your assignment at Leyden? <clears throat> same thing, once again. Oh, okay. I got thrown into the same sort of uh, thing again. And I'll tell you, uh, now I'll, I'll give you a little story there that was interesting. Uh, when I got there, uh, naturally, keeping clean is important. It's important for any GI, I guess it was. And so we would go in and we would shower. Now, the, I went over there the first time to shower. And inside the shower, which was enclosed, all these women, Filipino women, would sit within the shower, sit down and watch. Watch a shower. So, you know, I, she was, I said, no, women never watched me shower or see my private parts. So I'm holding a washcloth here and I'm holding a washcloth there. The other guys are just go ahead and evidently they had been there, so they saw it. They had been used to it. After all, I says, my gosh, if they want to wash, watch, let them wash, watch. I'm going to go ahead and shower. And we did. And, you know, they sat there and they laughed. And all they did was they were amused by our washing ourselves and taking showers. But I thought that was a, you know, a funny story to pass along. Uh, after a while, uh, and once again, it's a time lapse once again, and the file was pulled mm -hmm. once again. And that's when I was sent up to uh, Manila. And uh, uh, when I was at Manila, uh, the base was located outside of Manila itself. I think at that time, as I remember, they told me they were losing anywhere from five to ten men a day on patrols outside of Manila. And uh, it was still foreign area to me. I went into Manila a couple times. As I remember, they said they had the Manila Symphony Orchestra still operating. They had people who could play instruments and they held concerts. I never attended any of them. Uh, but it seemed to me that it was still type, a type of primitive society over there because uh, we would come back and although, it, you know, you hear of prostitution and but we would come back from Manila and these women would be like, come and meet my sister, come and meet my sister. And, you know, uh, 
I don't know how many GIs ever did it and how many went that way, but it would seem a sort of business for these people to try and get some sort of money in which to exist and so and subsidize themselves in order to, you know, get food and whatnot. Mm -hmm. uh, but Nilda was there short and, uh, and then I was shipped down to Lady Island. It wasn't one. Then this was uh, when uh, I thought I would go on the ship up to, uh, to uh, what's your name, Iwo Jima. That's the time I thought, well, now's my time. I'm going to go forward. I'm going to go up whatever there is in an organization and go up there. And lo and behold, they pulled the file once again and we're on my ship back down to Lady Island again. This port there was very, very short, and before I know it, they shipped me back to Manila, and it was about time for me to go home. Uh, as I say, you can see by this shifting around and not being with any organization long enough to get anybody, number one, there was no chance of promoting myself within any of these things. Uh, you know, that was out of the question because that was being shift, shifted all over the place. Uh, and then uh, I was very, very, I consider myself very, very fortunate because uh, when I consider uh, all those people that became wounded, number one, uh, and who served in the South Pacific, when I consider all those who, uh, who contracted various types of diseases over there, the worst thing I ever saw was somebody who had malaria. We took out, out it was, I forget what it was the, uh, they didn't have quinine. Atropine. Huh? I think it was called atropine. Yeah, yeah. We Adabrin, took, Adabrin, Adabrin, Adabrin. Adabrin, that was Adabrin, that was it. And the worst thing I ever saw was I was in Manila one night and a fellow had a malaria attack. It was hot, but he was just soaked, just soaked up in the blankets. He couldn't keep warm, just shaking all over. Horrible thing it was. So, if I consider just that alone, I was lucky to come out of that. Mm -hmm. I was really. So you never contracted any kind of illnesses. No, the only thing, thing I contracted over there, because I tried to keep as clean as possible, mm -hmm. keeping that in mind, was that I developed some sort of fungus on my fingers, in which bubbles come up, and uh, during the last, I'd say, uh, ten years that suddenly dissipated. These bubbles would come up and there was only one type of medication and I could get which was 90% alcohol and things that was salt. And I'd have to dab it on that and have that dry up these bubbles. If I broke the bubbles, it would spread. Mm. It would mm. spread. So, uh, uh, but outside of that, and outside of uh, uh, ligaments in my leg, that, that wasn't Really, that was kind of the result of playing when I was uh, but over there. Uh, I hurt myself that way. No, I come out, I must say, I come out pretty clean and very grateful for that. Mm -hmm. And uh, then uh, finally, a call came to come home, and then I was discharged. Okay, so you were discharged in 46, February 46. Yeah. Okay. What, did you do anything when you got back to the States, or were you just... I got back to the States. Uh, I got off the boat, I think I weighed 167 pounds at that time. I was thinned down, I was nothing, and the only thing I could think of was getting enough milk into me and enough food to eat. Mm -hmm. But then I thought about uh, going to school. And, uh, did you use the GI Bill? Yes, I used the GI Bill. Mm -hmm. And thank God for that. Thank God for that. Now what did you use it for? Huh? What did you use it for? To go to college? Yes, to go to college. Yes. Okay. Did you buy a home through it too? No, or? I never bought a home. I just used it to go to school. Mm -hmm. Okay. And did you ever use the 5220 club? Ah, that, see, that could have, I think I, I think I did use it for a short period of time. Mm -hmm. I don't know for how long, mm -hmm. but I think I did. Okay. That, that brings up... Can, Memories, they gave you so much money. Yes, I yes, $20 a week for 52 weeks. Oh yeah, I think I did. I think mm -hmm. I got that money. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, the only thing today, I wish they had it then. Uh, my family did not have the background in order to screen colleges or say where to go or how much it would cost. Mm -hmm. They just didn't have that background in my family. Uh, so 
It was me still coming out pretty raw at that time after this three years saying, gee, where should I go? Should I go close by? Yeah, I guess I'll go close by. And I did. So I went to school close by. Mm -hmm. I didn't go to way to school. Okay. So I um, <clears throat> did you ever join any veterans organizations? No. no. <clears throat> I, uh, uh, my personal opinion, I have a disdain for them because I think they're too politically orientated. Uh, and uh, uh, if it was anything that would uh, make contributions to paralyzed veterans, but I, you know, to me, maybe it's a fun group or whatnot, whatever it is, but I think it's too politically mm -hmm. orientated. And that, that includes the American Legion and the Veterans of Foreign Wars. Mm -hmm. And I had an opportunity to ask you to join both. Mm -hmm. um, I, I know you <clears throat> kind of answered this in a way you never established any close friendships that you stayed close to anyone. Did you ever contact anyone that was in service with you? No, I did not. Yeah, because I know you said... Yeah, I have. You, okay, why don't you show that? <clears throat> Yeah. So what is that? Uh, it's just an address book here. Uh, it's got a lot of names in it, and I don't really, you know, uh, maybe there's, uh, there could be 30 names in here as far as I know. Maybe, maybe that much. But, uh, you know, I never, uh, I never contacted any of these people. They're all over the United States. Mm -hmm. And I guess I talked to these people and I said, what's your name? And can I have your address, mm -hmm. and maybe we'll get in touch. But getting in touch, we never did. So, but I kept the book mm -hmm. for some reason. I don't know why. I said, well, it's a nice memento. Yes. What? Um, how do you think your time in the service <clears throat> changed or had an effect on your life? <clears throat> uh, I think it. Well, besides the war in itself and its participation, and without getting into the patriotic, because we, I think we, everybody felt that way at that mm -hmm. time. It was, it was, I don't know, going into service that time, it was, it just seemed a patriotic thing to do. I can't tell you, mm -hmm. even though I was drafted, even though I went to the Air Force, I enlisted because it seemed to be the right thing to do. I can't tell you, as a young kid, mm -hmm. I felt that way. Mm -hmm. uh, but. Uh, I think it gave me a chance to meet a lot of people uh, in the United States that uh, from all over the country that I would have never had an opportunity to meet before. Uh, the unfortunate part about that is being so young, I could not really learn about their culture and their background uh, and you know what the things they did in life. And uh, I regret that in a way. But you know, it, I think I know it sounds cliche, but I think it helped rounded me out those those years. It helped rounded me out as a human being mm -hmm. to deal with other people on the outside. Mm -hmm. Do you think you would have gone to college if you didn't have the GI Bill, or yes, I would have gone. To would have gone to, okay. Yeah, I would have gone. Mm -hmm. Okay, I was determined to do. Yes. All right. Now these are some photographs you brought in. If you could hold them up in front of you like this, Wayne could focus on it and you tell a little bit yeah. about that. Um, uh, this looks as though, yeah, this was taken in Salt Lake City. Uh, I don't have the exact date, but evidently it was before I went overseas. Mm -hmm. All right? Mm -hmm. uh, these others, uh, this here, once again, is uh, in the Philippine Islands, in Lady Island. Uh, you can see the general way we dressed. We weren't in uniforms of any kind. It was hot over there. Uh, now, are you in that picture? Uh, uh, yeah. This is this is me right down the bottom here, the very bottom in the middle here. There were two other fellows there, and I don't even remember their names. I okay. don't even remember their names. Okay. 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 Uh, this here is one of the barracks. I don't know uh, where it was. It was just, you know, you'd walk around in uniform. I guess we posed for the pictures, so we put on the helmets and all that. Uh, this here, uh, I'm guessing that this was, uh, I'm not sure whether this was in Hollandia or whether this was in Lady Island here. This picture was taken. 
Okay. Okay. This here, uh, once again, was Lady Ireland. See the types of ships that were out there. One thing I learned never to do, oh, here's once again, uh, you know, vehicles available. I think this was all, could have also been Lady Island at the time. All the pictures I have here seem to be Lady Island. Mm -hmm. Okay, now these are your patches. You yeah, had. this is the patch of the Air Force, mm -hmm. okay? And uh, this one here is the 13th, which I was attached to. That was the squadron, all right? Mm -hmm. And this is the patch for AACS, which is Army Airways Communication System. And, uh, now, where would you wear that patch? You'd wear it right on the shoulder, on the with shoulder. also. Mm -hmm. All right, you'd wear them on the shoulder. You'd mm -hmm. wear, you'd wear them on down. Generally, mm -hmm. I don't remember wearing, remember wearing this here. You'd wear this over here, or maybe this up here. Mm -hmm. Or you could wear this just about any place, mm -hmm. just as identification of the organization. This was the most important thing you wore mm -hmm. up here, the 13th shoulder you were attached to. Uh, and uh, uh, the ribbons, uh, I can't tell you there. Uh, all these ribbons were, were on my discharge, uh, various uh, places that I were. I see the Good Conduct Medal. Good the, Conduct. Uh, Everybody got the Good Conduct. Asiatic here. Pacific Medal, the World War II Victory Medal. Yeah. And then uh, uh, this one here, I don't remember. All I know is uh, I had recently, my son asked me if I would get my, the medals, because I never, mm -hmm. I never rode away from my medals. I, you know, didn't interest me. And my son said I'd like to have them. So I rode away, I got my congressman to intervene, and he got me the medals, and I turned the medals over to him. The only medals I didn't get was for the Philippines, because if you want to get those medals from the Philippines now, you have to apply for them and pay for them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So they, they don't give them out free anymore. Yeah. Well, okay, thank you very much for your interview. Okay.